Hello friends, welcome to Be Waste Wise. Uh, I am Shweta Vandapani. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. Uh, we were just before the panel began, I was talking to all the panelists about whether uh, everyone's working from home still or have gone back to work. So I really hope all of you are safe wherever you are. And uh, I hope uh, you're happy with working from home as well. And uh, in today's panel, we are gonna be discussing international developments in single use plastic bands. We have Jonathan Cocker who, uh, who's partner at Baker and McKinsey. He is moderating today's panel. This is the first panel that he's moderating for Be Waste Wise and we're very excited about it. Jonathan is gonna be speaking with Sally Ann Kastner, who's director of Circular Vision. She's based in South Africa. We have Sumangali Krishnan, chief business officer at GA Circular. She's based in Singapore. And we have Sarah Edwards, CEO, Unomia Research and Consulting in North America. Uh, uh, we're very happy that Jonathan has put a pretty diverse panel together. And uh, just a quick reminder to all of you, we will be taking audience questions. The panelists and Jonathan are going to be very happy to answer your questions. Please use the Q&A section. The last uh, 25 minutes of the panel has been allotted for your questions. So over to you, Jonathan. I think you can take over from here. Thank you very much. And I, I want to um, thank the panelists uh, for uh, participating today. This is a, a, a stellar group and I think we've got a lot of geographic uh, coverage and a lot of insight at different touch points within uh, both single-use single use plastics as well as perhaps plastics and packaging more generally. So uh, it's a great group and I hope we can uh, use our time wisely. So if I can, Sally, um, let me pass first to you to describe the kind of work you've been doing uh, with Circular Vision and, and perhaps as well with the African Circular Economy Network. Sure, thanks very much. Um, great to be part of this, this panel and discussion. Um, yep, so I'm currently working with uh, Circular Vision and uh, the African Circular Economy Network, which was uh, um, founded as a nonprofit company in South Africa with our headquarters here with representation across the continent, which is really great. We've uh, got over 31 countries represented at present. And um, we, we're really wanting to see how we can transition Africa to more circular practices. And in many cases, there are so many case studies in Africa already that are inherently circular. It's essentially trying to ensure that we don't maybe move too quickly in the traditional trajectory of linear lock-in. So my work currently focuses at this point um, a lot on the waste side still, but uh, waste for me has always been an indicator of how we can do things differently right at the beginning of the, the value chain. So yeah, my, my work is quite diverse. Um, anything from packaging um, to industries and commercial uh, resource efficiency and cleaner production type of work for with uh, energy, water and, and waste indicators. So yeah, quite diverse, uh, which keeps life interesting and uh, keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> and, when, and when you said 31 countries uh, within Africa, are, do you find yourself uh, uh, looking at those different countries and, and what kinds of uh, diverse kinds of initiatives are occurring? Absolutely, because there are many diverse uh, initiatives happening. Um, so we have, uh, part of our executive, we've got uh, some representation, but mostly our countries are represented to, uh, represented by country leads, um, and we engage with them often. Uh, and at the moment, we're actually involved in a project um, with the European Commission um, as a subconsultant and contributor, uh, looking at uh, different countries within Africa. Our particular countries at this point are Morocco, Rwanda, and Kenya. Um, and uh, yeah, it's been, it's fascinating because we, we just see so many different case studies coming out of these um, countries. And many, as you know, have also implemented various bans, especially on plastic, um, yeah. which, ha and I'm sure we'll, we'll get into discussion um, about that uh, later on as well. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you very much. Mm. So, Sarah, may I ask you um, what what sort of work have you guys been doing? And I, I say you guys, meaning Anomia more generally, and then obviously Sarah Edwards more more specifically. Yeah, so obviously Anomia Research and Consulting is a very mission driven environmental consultancy that has a real focus on waste and resource management, and more recently in kind of driving the circular economy. So, as a business, we operate across 
originated in the UK, but also operate, operate across North America as well as other parts of Europe. And, you know, for many years, one of our key clients has really been the European Commission. Um, so some of the types of work we've been doing recently across Europe is that Unomia was actually the primary advisor to the European Commission on its single use plastics directive. So as part of that work back in 2018, we were asked to look at what, um, what single use um, plastics were most prevalent in our environment and to come up with measures to, to address those, that, those um, single use plastics. So as part of that work, we did analysis around looking at um, what the most prevalent items were on, um, on, on littered on beaches in, across Europe. And you know, our study found that it was 80% of beach litter was plastic related. Um, and of that 100% of beach litter, 50% was single use plastic di plastics items were the most um, uh, proficient was, bit, was pl uh, plastic bottles, caps and, and, and beverage related um, plastic litter. So as part of our work, we then looked at what measures could be put in place to address these different plastics. And that's kind of what ended up being in the single use plastics directive. More recently, I think we've been doing work around packaging in general, so not just looking at plastic packaging, but looking um, but at all um, packaging. And we've been working with the European Commission on modulating fees under extended producer responsibility programmes, which we might touch on later. Um, across the North America, we've been working very heavily on a lot of plastic um, studies. We're currently working in Washington on the West Coast, looking at mapping out the flows of plastics within into and out of Washington and looking at what policy measures they may be able to put in place. And just touching on Sally Ann's point, we actually did a big study for WWF actually recently in Kenya, looking at mapping the flows of plastics through, um, through Kenya to look at what policy measures they might be able to implement as well. So, you know, me a kind of reach is quite vast. Um, and really we've come into plastics from very much a litter perspective. So we did a, a, a lot of work 10 years ago, looking at, you know, littering, um, in general, and that that kind of highlighted to us the prevalence of plastics in env our environment and the need to address plastics specifically. Yeah. And, and may I ask you, Sarah, in terms of the, the EU directive, have we seen any member states adopt it yet? And if so, have we seen anything uh, substantive that we can look at and, and point to in terms of a, a trend perhaps across Europe? So effectively, um, the directive came into place in 2019 and all member states, so effectively member states have the ability to implement the directive as they say, see fit. So, you know, one of the key clauses, for instance, under the directive is that you have to, by 2029, collect for recycling 90% of plastic beverage bottles, PET beverage bottles. Now, member states have until July 2021 to put in place their specific legislation that's going to enable them to meet those those the requirements of the directive so some of the complexities around this is specifically for instance on that issue is that some member states are, are going full forward with deposit refund systems obviously they're known across many parts of europe to be very effective at collecting beverage containers in other countries there's a huge opposition to this type of initiative because it actually removes valuable material from curbside services. So they're trying to look at other ways in terms of trying to meet this 90% target. So we're still kind of in the transition period, looking at what the different member, how the different member states might enact the in legislation. Um, and there's some guidance coming around now in terms of what does, for instance, collect, you know, co separately collect mean and some of the definitions around there. So what has been highlighted from the single use plastics directive is that there are producers that are trying to um, classify their products not necessary as plastics and there's uh, there's some um, some discussions around the definition of plastics within that directive and for us as a company we were much more f we believe that, that the directive should actually focus on single use items in general and not just single use plastic items you know obviously part of the work that we did do looked at the alternatives to the plastic items before sort of proposing a ban but what we want to try and do is move away from single use in in its entirety um, and i think that's where the directive was a little kind of missed an opportunity um, to really move the agenda and move the, you move the needle on you know pushing the management of waste up waste hierarchy and developing more of a circular economy. Yeah, and look, I think it, uh, I, I think it's fair to say that the, the directive itself isn't a, a sort of turnkey solution for the rest of us, those outside of Europe. And so I think there's a lot to be done to get from where uh, the EU started to where each country wishes to be. Um, so, so, so Mangali, may I ask you, in terms of the, 
single-use plastics as, as well as packaging and plastics more generally. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about the kind of work that you've been doing? Can you hear me? Yes, great. Um, uh, we've been mirroring a little bit of what uh, Sarah was saying. It sounds really familiar. We've uh, been actively working, uh, looking at uh, plastics and packaging and circular economy more from a waste management perspective, recognizing that that was one of the most underserved um, areas in, in the Southeast Asian region as we were looking at sustainability. So we've been in the sustainability space since 2012, but then we've been active in waste management project, projects in the region um, over the last three to four years. And uh, it, primarily we've looked at material flows uh, just to understand exactly what, uh, how, how materials transition, especially in the post-consumer phase, in through the informal sector, uh, which is very, very prevalent in the Southeast Asian countries, as well as uh, what sort of recycling technologies and market opportunities exist within these regions. Um, another key uh, point was the, you know, the closing of the, the Chinese market and the import of, of uh, plastics um, meant that a lot of the countries in Southeast Asia were then um, designated as the diversion uh, for a lot of these plastics, which um, had a, 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 a positive and a negative consequence. It definitely um, allowed for a recycling industry to flourish in some of these countries. And so uh, to some degree, local materials could also be recycled. And then there was an opportunity for local supply and feedstock to be recycled. But then the challenge was also the fact that there was a lot of a lot of waste being dumped on, in these countries, and which then has now led to some of the bans and the policy measures that have uh, taken place. So um, transitioning in through from that material flow uh, and, and understanding how different types of plastics and different types of packaging, so not just plastics, but different types of packaging, given their single-use nature as well. Um, We've been trying to understand how collection, how disposal and collection can can work better, and also um, trying to um, trying to uh, push towards a voluntary uh, packaging recovery organizations or producer responsibility organizations. You can sort of uh, a little bit of a play on on the PRO term, but. Um, essentially trying to get uh, businesses and clients that we've been working with to come together as a collective and to initiate some of the projects and, and uh, customize them to the ASEAN context. So understanding that each of the different countries that we're working in have a, have a unique requirement and a unique policy response as well, because some countries are further ahead in their um, policy framework with regards to packaging and plastics and as well as single-use plastics and so uh, yeah it's been it's been quite an interesting and exciting uh, uh, few years and uh, we've also been active in the uh, in the you know examining it from the policy perspective as well as the behavior change angle um, so we've been um, quite active in a lot of these areas that touch upon packaging specifically and, and, and may, I, may I stay with you in, in terms of, of uh, what kind of uh, regulation we're going to see? Um, you talked about packaging more generally, and I think we heard, we heard Sarah a minute ago talk about uh, a push to regulate single-use items, not just plastic items, and then separately to, to look at packaging. It, does, it, does it make sense in the ASEAN countries to have a divide between the single-use plastics and perhaps all single-use items on one side and then packaging PPP more conventionally on the other side. Is that a divide that makes sense outside of Europe? It, um, to some degree, I think there is a distinction between the two uh, with packaging and especially higher value types of packaging. So if we were there, the overlap exists in the case of, of beverage bottles, I think, PET bottles. And so, um, to the extent that that's a highly recovered and collected and highly recycled item, um, it sort of has its own own uh, own trajectory. And the other single-use plastics that we're looking at, or single-use materials that we're looking at, are often uh, sachets and straws and and um, uh, you know 
uh, food containers, polystyrene food containers, which uh, unfortunately have a high tendency to litter. And so that, that becomes a very unique waste management problem. And so there, there might be some benefit in addressing the littering aspect of single use items or single use plastics that then enter the environment and cause a lot of, uh, cause a lot of the marine debris challenges that we've been looking at. But um, I think lumping it all together, uh, you know, as under packaging or under a larger law, it might be, uh, might be a bit overreaching, I guess, in, in terms of a policy measure. So, Sally Ann, do you have any thoughts on that? Whether the, this divide is a, is, is a workable divide or whether there needs to be sort of a, a revisiting of how we look at these materials? I think it comes down to, and it's such a, because uh, we've had a similar debate, um, because essentially if we're just focusing on single use plastics, the materials that we substitute these single use items with could be problematic. and. We've seen it already happen in South Africa where certain items are being replaced by what is thought to be um, better materials. Uh, so bioplastics seem to be coming on stream in a much bigger way with uh, the marketing that goes around that saying that if you toss it out the window, it's absolutely fine and, and it will degrade in the environment, which is ultimately the wrong messaging to be putting out there with, with any material especially if we're looking at a more circular, you know, approach. So I think maybe single use plastics could be a bite sized chunk that we need to actually start somewhere um, in order to maybe just look at those problematic items, um, especially, you know, those, um, the little single use sachets that Simangili has mentioned and the little sweet wrappers that you know, we, yeah, that are all over the place or lollipop sticks or earbud sticks. I mean, these things are just universal. Surely we can design those types of things out um, just through a better, a better approach. So I think, I think by compartmentalizing it maybe into just single use plastics for now is maybe um, a good place to start. But ultimately I do think we need to look at our throwaway society and this whole throwaway culture of using something once. It does not make any sense. <laughs> and how can we rather move to more re, um, reuse, refill, return type of systems and really see what business models we can stimulate by that, especially in an African context or a, a developing economy context how do we actually go back to some of those really cool business models um, that stimulate a more uh, intense customer relationship? Um, yeah. Anyway. Thank, thank you. Those, those are really interesting comments. Sarah, do, do you have any comments maybe uh, with perhaps your EU hat on and then perhaps uh, from outside the EU? No, I think, um, I mean, I think, you know, from a perspective of, single use, again, we are very much, you know, aligned to that moving to the reuse, refill, return model. I mean, from an EU perspective, you know, we, and then we've seen this also, you know, in, in the US really, any kind of single use plastics, the alternatives should also have some form of fee associated with them so that it, people can have a single use item, but there's a fee attached to it. So we, we may want to ban single use plastic bags, for instance, but then there's a fee attached to a, a paper single use ban so that you encourage the reuse option. And I think that's, that's kind of what we're seeing, or wanting to see across Europe and what we're kind of seeing as well in some parts of North America. Um, I mean, look, look, I think, I think it's, a, it's a broader policy issue and I think it, it's ultimately a waste management issue um, as well. It's not simply a, something that is uh, within the field of what I would describe as product compliance. In other words, it's not merely a standard, but rather there's, uh, there appears to be sort of a, a, a holistic need to look at this. Uh, and as Sally says, um, hopefully generate those new kinds of opportunities, which I think we all agree uh, on this call that are out there. It's just a question of facilitating uh, those, the business conditions to make that happen. Um, may, may I ask, uh, Simangali, can, can I ask you to comment a bit on uh, what kinds of legislation we've seen to date in the ASEAN countries and, and with a focus maybe on uh, what is 
essentially a set of bans or restrictions on, on products, including carrier bags, versus uh, legislation that looks at the sort of whole waste management system and whether or not there can be improvements in that system to accommodate the kinds of narrowly focused single-use plastics developments. Right, and um, I think, you know, uh, similar to the, the single-use plastics directive and, and, and sort of in the wake of that directive, there's been a lot of activity in each of the, uh, each of the countries in uh, South Asia as well as Southeast Asia, um, with plastic bags being quite, you know, actively targeted. But in addition, there's also been, a, you know, in Malaysia, they've come up with a um, zero waste, a zero, uh, the roadmap to zero single use plastics by 2030, which is uh, quite an ambitious plan, uh, again. Uh, one might always almost say too ambitious because it, it's so wide and, and, you know, and um, also pushes very heavily towards biodegradable plastics, which again raise a big question in terms of quality standards and you know, when and what conditions. Even in the EU, there have been some challenges with you know, to what degree and, and in what, what conditions can they be biodegradable. So a lot of the definitional challenges and loopholes thrown by a plastic bag ban or regulation. So, you know, when, when they've banned a certain thickness, other products have come out, so thicker bags or with uh, woven plastic bags that are equally, or if not more challenging, have come in to use. And um, also when there's been charges, there have been uh, sort of workarounds where uh, people have been, you know, getting lower quality or lower grade or other types of plastic bags. And it's, it's also inadequately enforced. And that's the biggest challenge, I think, in the ASEAN region is that any regulation, even when it is put out there, it has to be something that contemplates how it's actually going to be enforced and how much you know, the government and the industry are going to be hand in hand in trying to get these measures actually be impactful. Um, so in Indonesia, they did attempt to, uh, you know, the plastic bag ban, and in this case, they attempted to get the retailers to be participant in the, uh, in the uh, behavior change process and have them really actively engaged with their customers in order to uh, reduce the use of plastic bags. So such efforts have been somewhat or mildly successful, but then there's also a very strong plastics lobby and the plastic bags are, are considered to be quite, um, quite convenient and necessary. And, and, and now in the, in the post COVID era, it's probably going to be even more amplified the need for single use plastics and, and, and plastic bags. So, um, that's been a big challenge in terms of just being, uh, a, a, you know, a, a unique target. Um, when there have been obviously other measures that are looking at packaging as a whole, because in in that particular instance, uh, you could the um, these governments can actually look at industry to regulate some of the packaging that's being put out. So there's a direct. Um, yeah, connection with the, the packaging manufacturer and packaging producer to come up with solutions or to come up with uh, an, uh, a, a solution to reduce the amount of packaging that's out there in the environment. But that's a different touch point than plastic bags and single use plastics that have, that have a myriad manufacturers and producers. We just don't know where it comes from. <laughs> Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, that's part of the challenge, I think, in, 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 across the world, frankly. Um, so Sally Ann, can I, I ask you the same question in terms of what we're seeing in Africa? Are we seeing uh, product uh, compliance uh, restrictions, bans, or are we seeing uh, sort of w holistic waste management initiatives or perhaps a bit of both? What's interesting is that we're actually seeing a combination of things and depending on where you are, um, it's kind of more leaning to the one side or the other. Um, just in terms of South Africa, what's been quite amazing in the last couple of years, there's been a very, very strong push for government engagement. So our environmental department has, has looked at uh, a policy review of all the existing legislation around waste and 
and uh, the plastic bags, for, for example, specifically as well, um, because in South Africa, we've got a levy on our, our, our plastic bags. Um, so the actual um, implementation of that wasn't necessarily um, poor, but unfortunately the management of the actual levies that was, um, or the levies that are um, obtained are, are not ring fenced. So they go straight into the fiscus, um, and, uh, which, which then, you know, the, the money is not used where perhaps it really needs to be used in terms of the collection or the recycling um, initiatives, etc. Um, the, we've got another um, other um, uh, collaborations, if you like, where the minister um, is actually working together with uh, industry right now to try and set up a framework for extended producer responsibility and what this could look like in a South African environment. So that's quite a big uh, step forward to where we were a few years ago, where we were looking at uh, waste management plans specifically for paper and packaging. Um, another initiative, which is a voluntary initiative at this point, is signing up to the Plastics Pact. So we've actually got a South African um, Plastics Pact um, and uh, levering, leveraging off some quite um, ambitious, uh, ambitious targets, including taking action on problematic or unnecessary plastic packaging through redesign, innovation, or alternative reuse, reuse or delivery models. 100% of plastic packaging. Hello. Yeah. Oh, yep. Sorry about that. I got cut off. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Technology, yeah. yeah. Um, so um, I think I was in terms of just the, the South African Plastics Pact. 70% um, of plastic packaging to be effectively recycled and 30% average recycled content across all plastic packaging. So these are really ambitious, ambitious targets. Um, to try and reach by 2025. And this is a voluntary initiative um, and it's, it's been assisted by RAP in the UK and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and who are also looking at various other African cities to try and do something similar. Um, so it's definitely a combination of policy and legislation. Um, but in, in many of our African countries, we've actually gone with bans, which have perhaps had unintended consequences of, of alternative materials that are coming into the market that now can't be managed. Um, so I think there's definitely room for the working together um, and collaborating across government uh, and the private sector to try and come with, with uh, more workable solutions, especially in a developing economy context. Right. So, so, so Sally, do, do you see the, the sort of voluntary sector effectively uh, filling in where uh, the, at, the, at the national level there's, there is law but not necessarily uh, as much tangible action and effectiveness as, as you might hope? Definitely. I, I would hope that there would be more um, producer responsibility here. Um, we've got major gaps uh, in terms of collection and infrastructure and um, just in terms of waste management in general. Um, so we, we need more or closer working together um, and self-regulation as opposed to trying, trying to enforce additional legislation or policy. Um, we've got quite amazing legislation and policy in South Africa right now, but the enforcement of it, except during COVID, which is interesting, <laughs> but that's a whole nother discussion. Um, <laughs> different panel, different panel. Completely different panel. But uh, generally, the enforcement is not, is not great. Um, so we've, we've got, uh, yeah, pollution and litter and just, you know, not, not everyone has access to the same level of service. Um, we, our recycling sector is fairly well established and I think we've, we've done very well from that perspective. But uh, so much more could be done, but we definitely need to, to work together with private sector and can't rely only on the government to, to uh, step in. Yeah, yeah. S Sarah, can I ask you, in, in terms of what you've been seeing outside of the EU, have, have we had these sort of uh, paper tigers that purport to do many things around single-use plastics, but ultimately lack the kind of infrastructure uh, that we might see filled in perhaps by the voluntary sector? I mean, I think, I mean, from a, I mean, I think from a, a voluntary, um, a voluntary commitment point, I think 
I think this is a little bit of a, a red herring. I mean, I think, I think there is clearly um, policy that can be very, um, um, very um, detailed and, and, and therefore be much harder to, to, to regulate and have a much higher cost for, um, for regulating and penalizing people that don't meet that requirement. But our view is that the, you know, that the brands and producers are not openly going to meet any voluntary commitments that they may set unless there's that policy backstop. And from our perspective, it's very much around building and putting in place policy that allows producers to put in place the systems needed to meet specific goals and targets, you know, in the medium to long term and giving them fr the freedom to be able to invest in that infrastructure so that you do guarantee to get the investment. Voluntary commitments that we've seen, you know, over the last 15 years, numerous voluntary commitments by various different um, producers that have, that have just not, have not been met. So from our point of view, it's providing the enabling policy legislation that's not overly restrictive, that doesn't tie the hands of the producers to put in place the right systems, but really ensure that they're held to account when they don't meet specific targets and end goals. Can, can, can I stay with you then, Sarah, in terms of those, those kind of mechanisms? I mean, EPR is often viewed as the panacea, um, but uh, perhaps it, it has its selective uses. And I think under the directive, even we've seen that it, it isn't purporting to be the only solution. Can, can you talk a bit about what kind of measures would make sense? What kind of mix we might see out there in terms of single use plastics, uh, a regulatory scheme that works? I mean, I think that there is different measures. So, I mean, for instance, what we're seeing potentially more of in the US where EPR is a harder nut to crack and a harder policy measure to implement is a, dr a drive to, to looking at minimum recycled content, for instance, in single use item packaging or um, um, and what effectively that does is, you know, when you have the escalation of, of recycled content requirements within a piece of packaging, it effectively drives the need to purchase that R pair or whatever material, you know, that recycled content is placed on. So it effectively drives automatically the market, which, which then allows for investment in infrastructure because there is that demand to meet those recycled content goals. So, you know, Washington State, for instance, on the West Coast passed, you know, had this piece of legislation go to the governor. He was ready to sign a minimum recycled content on beverage containers, but unfortunately COVID and came along and put that on hold. So these are kind of less um, controversial, I suppose, policy measures that actually help drive demand and therefore drive investment in collection. And let me ask, I know you've, you've done some work on DRS. Can, do you see that as well as being part of the sort of policy mix? Um, completely. I mean, I think, you know, from a littering perspective, and if you want to maximize, I mean, DRS deposit refund systems are obviously predominantly used on beverage containers, you know, across the board, but, you know, we have seen them and we are looking them as a company on, on items like sachets, for instance, that, you know, we've mentioned earlier as a mechanism, an incentive mechanism to drive return systems. And they're very simple mechanisms to put in place and they have very high effective um, collection um, rates. And what we're seeing is because of the the brands making such big commitments around the use of um, recycled content within their beverage containers, they are actually wanting to take more ownership of these programs because effectively um, they're having to buy this recycled content on the open market, uh, you know, and competing with many other products in the U S for instance, you know, most of the, the recycled PET from beverage containers that are collected through the deposit systems find their way into carpets. So not even going bottle to bottle. So producers are actually seeing a, an, a, you know, see, having a big interest in container deposit programs because it enables them to retain the ownership of that material, which they can then use to fulfill their commitments around minimum recycled content. Yeah. 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 Look, I, and I think, I, I think, you know, you raise COVID and this is not a COVID panel, but I think that also has become relevant, has it not, in terms of uh, recycle content in, in food and beverage packaging. And that's, I think we haven't, we haven't fully resolved uh, what role recycle content will have uh, in terms of packaging going forward. But, but it's certainly something I think that's being discussed, is it not, uh, in various places as to, as to what, what those standards might look like and whether or not they might be separately channeled and streamed than, than other kinds of recycled plastic. Yeah, I mean, I think most, you know, countries have the, you know, have regulation around food grade standard plastics. And I suppose it's a point of reviewing that. But I mean, from our perspective, you know, if we, you know, we've looked at single use, single use items, single use coffee cups, single use items where you have the plastic 
cover on your coffee cup and actually there's more contact and the more opportunity for um you know um bacteria to be on those items and when when you're using a reusable cup for instance so i think it's definitely a big red herring that they the chemical you know the chemical companies are using as a mechanism to slow down progression on the use of recycled content and that so far there's been absolutely no evidence to suggest that um you know the, the, the covid affects the ability to to you know have that material in other products yeah 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 so, so, so Mangali, may I ask you in terms of the the kinds of policy mechanisms that that uh, will ultimately have success going forward in the ASEAN countries. What are your thoughts, uh, EPR, uh, DRS, recycled content, uh, you know, levies? Yeah, I think... Uh, what's what's going to work? Uh, I think, um, you know, it's, it's really a policy mix, to be honest, uh, when you're looking at uh, addressing, because you're looking at addressing a, 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 a composite and... and, and uh, heterogeneous uh, set of items, if you will. So when you're looking at beverage packaging and bottles and uh, those that are re relatively easy to recover um, they, and, and also easy to uh, target in terms of manufacturers and, and brand owners. And so the, the EPR function is quite effective. When we're looking at products such as packed plastic bags or you know, wrappers and other assorted plastic items that have just an unknown number of manufacturers and, and producers, it's really hard to impose producer responsibility and administer that. And so you run into an issue of, of free riders just not not contributing to the problem and 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 uh, in regulating or self-regulating if you will um, so there are some challenges with that the same thing goes for drs systems as well in the asean region is is there, there it's, it's an expensive system to administer and it, it has its challenges when you're uh, looking at um, countries that have a high volume of uh, traditional trade stores. So it's not like we have you know, tons of malls or supermarkets in areas in, 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 and logistics are challenging in terms of actually bringing some of these materials back into. Um, and then fraud is another big, big issue, both in terms of using the packaging to make counterfeit products or you know, to just uh, you reuse the packaging for other purposes and then also uh, we, a fraud within the DRS system or to you know, manipulate uh, these collection mechanisms in such a way to extract more out of it. So um, there's definitely challenges in terms of implementation of a lot of these regulations, but I totally agree with Sarah in terms of having that enabling regime is necessary. So there needs to be some sort of an umbrella approach which recognizes that many of these materials need to be limited and that a, that, that a varied approach depending on the type of material. So if it's plastic bags, then you know, where can we reduce the usage and, and reduce consumption and really nudge maybe you know, uh, people to move away from, from having to use and coming up with alternative mechanisms of, of, um, of consumption. Um, on one hand, and then in, in, on, when it comes to certain types of packaging that do have a solution, that do have an alternative in terms of being able to be recycled, such as plastic bottles, uh, they're you know, ensuring that all of these materials actually, in fact, recovered in a single stream, uncontaminated manner, so that there, there is a solution that is of high value um, retained within, uh, within the, within the uh, value chain. Yeah, 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 and and, and look, I, I um, let me S Sally before we go to questions, um, let me pause at the same question to you in ter in terms of those mixes and I, and I think we, we you know we've heard from Samangali and from Sarah that it's it it it's not a, s a simple answer, but it's certainly um, th there are certainly uh, different types of materials that will perhaps uh, more easily be managed under certain types of mechanisms. Do you do you have any thoughts as to what might work within uh, within the EU? Uh, it was a question posed to, to me, Jonathan. Yeah. Yes. So in, in South Africa, um, what's been great uh, is the discussion around the different mechanisms. And extended producer responsibility is definitely um, the focus at the moment in terms of how uh, this will be managed. Industry are really trying hard to ensure that the the PROs and the funds um, obtained through the EPR scheme 
would be managed by industry. Um, only because then industry can go use that those funds to direct directly for um, uh, initiatives in order to to get those materials back to where they need to be. Um, that that's definitely a focus here in, in South Africa. Um, so, but they're looking at different mechanisms. The government is looking at policy um, and and reviewing all of our policies and legislative landscape at this point surrounding. Um, especially plastics, um, that is the big focus because obviously that, that is, uh, you know, most often seen. And um, so, yeah, definite mix, policy mix um, and industry collaborating uh, with government. Um, within the last year, I think we've seen a much better relationship developing. Uh, where in the past there have been quite quite strained um, and very uh, contentious debates. So that's great to see. Um, we are seeing other materials, like I mentioned earlier, the bioplastics coming onto the market, which are causing some concern. And uh, But uh, what's quite great is that more recently a compostables association, or rather, let me say what uh, the actual association name, which is very it's hot off the press, um, it's basically the um, bio, what is, sorry, Compostable Plastics Association is what it's called. Um, so it's still in the, in the process of being formulated, but essentially they're even saying that these materials need to have an EPR um, associated with it so that there can be some sort of control. Um, at the moment, it's a free-for-all. People are switching to these materials because uh, firstly, they, there wouldn't be any um, mandatory requirement to sign up to an EPR plan and um, it's yeah they they seem to be almost um, saying that this is the responsible option unfortunately it's not and it's causing other unintended consequences uh, there are obviously I do feel that there is a space for compostables in 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 packaging but uh, fit for purpose applications we need to design with the next use in mind, essentially. So how do we use these compostable materials going forward? So roundabout answer to your question. Well, yeah, no, and thank you. We've got some questions from the audience and, and some of them touch on uh, uh, bioplastics broadly defined, including compostable. And I think, I think one, of the, uh, what, you know, one of the concerns we're seeing from the audience, and I think it's also true from uh, sort of the community at large is this this kind of free for all as you describe it. I mean, is it is there uh, in terms of adoption of of the use of uh, biodegradable plastics, for example, is there is it is there a sufficient uh, plan and infrastructure behind that adoption to make it work, or is it is it is it is it almost sort of a, a gut reaction, or as you say, maybe even a, a strategy to to uh, effectively avoid some of the more um, onerous obligations on plastics themselves. Yes, yeah. yeah. So from my point of view, uh, from my perspective, I definitely think at the moment it is being seen or being sold or marketed as a better alternative. Um, and and, and certain, certain companies, and maybe they don't dig too much deeper than that, but they feel that they're doing the right thing by going bioplastic or compostable option without necessarily doing the research behind that particular material. And not all of these materials are certified in terms of the international certifications of compostability or biodegradability. So in my per, in, from my perspective, I really think that um, if a brand owner or a retailer is going down this route, they need to investigate and see what is the fit for purpose application of a particular packaging. Um, for example, if you put, um, we've all used this example with a cucumber with a plastic wrapping over it, um, and that essentially uh, extends its shelf life. But perhaps a compostable solution might be the answer there. Um, and, but then it needs to be collected with an organic waste solution. And then it needs to be truly compostable, um, you know, within a very short mm -hmm. specified time. And there are very few of those around, you know, in terms of those types of raisins. Um, so I think we need to plan for these things. Um, and at the moment, certainly in South Africa, we don't necessarily have the infrastructure. We have commercial composting facilities, but we don't necessarily have the organic waste collection system at all. Um, but I think we can, yeah. this, this is a potential business model that we can start leveraging and start growing, but it's, it, it needs to start um, maybe small and in, in a controlled type of environment. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, and so Mongolia, are we seeing the same thing in the ASEAN countries, the, the kind of reversion to a, a, a biodegradable standard, but without necessarily the kind of planning and infrastructure behind it? Absolutely. I think there's, there's a big move and lots, and lots of uh, small and large businesses are now trying to come up with new products and, um, that are biodegradable or compostable and, uh, God forbid, <laughs> oxo biodegradable, which is another thing that's been challenging. And, and um, the, the, what it doesn't seem to take away, though, from, a, from the ASEAN context, especially, and I think it's true in South Africa and other in many other countries is the fact that these materials are still uh, being littered and so and they still behave like plastics because that's the that's the purpose that they were intended to so when they behave like plastic and they're still littered they still cause all of the same consequences that we would have um, you know at least for a period of time before they do actually if at all biodegrade in the environment in you know, and, and have access to the right conditions. So if they're entering the waterways and, and, and blocking the waterways or, you know, causing harm to marine life, all of that is still, is still ongoing. So we're, we're still not addressing the challenge that these products were, are creating. And it, we're just, it's again, it's a loophole uh, to, to uh, sort of uh, navigate the anti-plastic or, or plastic ban. Um, at best, at least as of now. Um, like Sally said, I think the solutions around composting and around biodegrading uh, facilities are necessary. A big challenge in the, uh, in the urban settings in ASEAN because of the fact that there isn't as much room to do composting and there isn't a composting use. I mean, where would we, if you're looking at large urban sprawls then if, and then not looking at an agricultural uh, setup, then what do we do with all of this compost that we suddenly have? Even, yeah. even if, it, if we assume that it's being segregated and separated uh, in a way that would be able to accomplish that. Yeah, and, and, and let me ask you, Sarah, the, um, in, in terms of those standards, those um, bioplastic standards, including uh, recovery standards, uh, there, there seems to be some recent research, including from Anomia around the, perf the performance of those standards on the ground within the within certain European countries, and what's the what's the the takeaway I think for the rest of us in terms of uh, what we should be looking at around those recovery standards? Uh, wh where will they work? How will they work? And 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 you know, does it make sense for all of us to to adopt them? Yeah, I mean, we've we've just finished a piece of work for the European Commission looking at you know what. As Sally said, what is a suitable application for some of, some of these bioplastics? Because you know, bioplastic comprises of obviously a whole range, family of different different materials with different properties and kind of applications. And you know, as part of that, we were very much we looked at you know where where could they be used, and then we, we looked at the um, effectiveness of the biodegradable process in existing infrastructure. And I think basically, you know, we comply with what Sally said. Really, if you know, if a if a bioplastic is used to cover a, a coffee pod or look at you know covering a piece of fruit or vegetable then you know that in a western or more developed um, system that has the ability to enter into a, a, a bio, um, an organics program and, and effectively go into a, um, a suitable facility when that material turns into a plastic you know bio bio based plastic bottle um, that material will either be put into a, a organics um, collection system and where we have no real data in terms of its the, the effectiveness of that biodegradability and, and the impact actually of those kind of what then becomes more of a microplastic or microbioplastic within um, within when it's applied to land we've got no studies relating to what that the impact of that might be and if it goes the alternative route then effectively that bioplastic is, if it's in a plastic bottle would potentially end up contaminating the you know the PET bale um, as it has yeah. a diff very different property. So we yeah. are, you know, we're really at the very early stages of understanding how this material should be used, how to regulate this material, um, and, and you know what the suitable applications are for it. Right, right. And look, look, we've got a, a a number of comments from the audience pointing pointing out some of the challenges. I think that 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 you just highlighted in in terms of having a, a system that actually works and having a a a, a compost product that will be uh, of value in an agricultural setting, um, and I, you know, I think we've heard comments as well around 
uh, pa packaging not being uh, biodegradable and yet being ultimately included within uh, the commercial food stream and being forced into uh, AD operations and that that creates some other issues. Is it is it is it conceivable that that because of these challenges, the the easier path in uh, resource recovery of plastics will ultimately be waste energy? Is is that the is that sort of the the default with with the other challenges if they don't get uh, resolved in the near term? So we're looking at just plastics. I mean, and we as a company completely disagree with the burning of plastics. Plastics is a effectively a fossil fuel. You're burning a carbon. Um, waste to energy is a very inefficient mechanism for, make, for generating energy and actually as we move forward most countries are decarbonizing their grids so I think even in the US now that you know it's almost at 50% um, renewables compared to you know reliance on coal so we it's, it's far better to collect the plastics and put it in a landfill site where there is pretty much inactive than actually um, and could be used in future through landfill mining potentially if you've got well-engineered landfill sites then to resort to energy from waste um, um so we're pretty much against any energy for waste solution yeah. for the implementation of plastic management yeah uh, so, so, so Mongoli, have you seen in the asean countries a, a a preference for or at least some some um uh growth in uh pro project work around uh waste energy for plastics and other kinds of materials that are otherwise not being recovered yes absolutely uh there's uh you know in singapore in and of itself there's the an active bias towards incineration and most of our waste is incinerated in the bottom ashes then landfilled um and and that has been that has been a technology that they have the they've sort of invested in early on and so we and we don't have much recycling much in the way of recycling in terms of plastics and packaging in singapore um in other countries in indonesia as well there's been a, a huge drive in many of the asean countries in fact uh buying the philippines which which has a, a an anti-burning regulation but many of the other countries are looking to wait at waste to energy as a, a solution to actually just get rid of the waste and and plastics having a higher calorific value and and being you know one part of the municipal solid waste which is which is organic waste uh, you know is almost necessary to make that incineration process um, happen because otherwise you're just burning wet waste so uh there's it's definitely an attractive uh solution also in in terms of uh flexible packaging when we're looking just directly at, at, at certain types of packaging and we're looking at solutions for sachets and and other uh types of single-use plastics uh the existing technologies in terms of pyrolysis or chemical uh you know decomposition are not they're not they're not there yet in terms of being able to be real solutions so uh rdf or burning in cement kilns becomes the the obvious sort of go-to or like next level like what do we do with we've collected all of this uh flexible waste and now what do we do with it we can't just uh it also is is challenging in in landfill sites in the asean region because they're not they're not uh, your typical sanitary landfills. Uh, they're quite likely to fly right out of, you know, especially the light, lightweight plastics and things like that can, can still continue to contaminate uh, oceans and water and, and, and waterways uh, that surround these landfills. So it's, it's, it's quite complex. I mean, it almost sounds like there's just almost no answer, <laughs> but um, yeah. yeah, it's quite challenging. Is, is there a concern, concern in the ASEAN region that if uh, waste energy is favored as a near-term solution, then it effectively becomes the long-term solution, given that infrastructure will have been built and capital invested? Yes, definitely. I mean, that, that would be my concern for sure. Uh, I think it also, it's, 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 it's a big investment. Uh, especially for many of these countries. It's a very large investment, both in terms of infrastructure as well as uh, a commitment to that type of waste solution. Uh, once we commit to a solution such as waste to energy and then put in that incineration plant, then it's it, it, then diverting 
you know, high calorific items away from it just doesn't make sense. So there's, there's that uh, dilemma that is bound to happen. Right. So, Sally Ann, can I ask you, have you, have you seen any, uh, any initiatives around waste energy as sort of the, the default, given the other kinds of challenges that exist in, in recapturing single-use plastics? So, yes, but there is quite a big opposition to it in South Africa. Um, one particular municipality actually did put in an application for an incinerator, incinerator, but within an integrated waste facility where they proclaimed to be first taking out um, all the valuable materials, including organic waste, and then only the residual would be burnt. But we, you can see what's going to happen. Essentially, it will become the solution and then you become locked into feeding this monster constantly. So I think we, uh, when these types of applications come through, we really, really, really do push back quite strongly against them. Uh, we're working with another um, municipal area where, um, in fact, we're looking at how do we control what comes in to our, our areas so that we can manage the waste coming out of it or the materials coming out of it. I know that sounds crazy, but, <laughs> it's kind of like procurement, right? So we can control, if we can control what comes in, we can control what's coming out of the system. And I think that's where we really, it's the more difficult option. There's no quick win and there's no easy, simple solution. So essentially, um, especially for like island communities and things like that, I'd really like to see if we can be bolder and say that actually, if, if we have to import all this into our country, how do we actually send our stuff back? <laughs> Yeah. Um, and, yeah. and, and I, I see what happens in the Maldives and it just breaks my heart um, to see that they literally constructed a landfill island, uh, which is permanently burning. Um, and um, they, they, you know, whole economy is essentially built on tourism, yet they have this, 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 this burning landmass. So I digress because it actually is, is I get quite uh, emotional about it maybe, but um, I think we really need to think bigger. We need to think harder. We need to be bolder. Um, and, and actually really try and push the more difficult decisions and actually say that if we've got these flexible packaging items out there that actually we can't do anything with, then they need, must be designed out. We need to find another way. <laughs> Quite frankly, <laughs> I don't have yeah. the answer, but we need to find <laughs> another way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, think, I think that's common among everyone on this, uh, on this call. Um, so, so Mangali, may, may I ask you, we've got some questions around uh, COVID and whether or not that that has impacted the movement of waste, including single use plastic waste within countries. So perhaps within the ASEAN region, are, have we seen any ripples from COVID that have changed some of those su supply chains? Um, there's definitely been a, a, a relaxation or a slowing down or the, of, of the, the, uh, the momentum towards uh, banning or regulating single-use plastics. So that, that uh, provision, uh, uh, for instance, the ban on, on plastic bags that was uh, in Indonesia that was due this June is likely not happening this June. And, uh, and, and part of that is just the regulatory and the administrative bodies not being as functioning as they probably should uh, at this uh, and are not being able to function the way they should. But then um, uh, I think there's also a big, uh, you know, uh, a lot of the businesses and industries, uh, plastics industries also asking for reprieve in terms of pushing back and saying that they don't want to be subject to. And I think this is happening with the European Union as well, where they're requesting, uh, the plastics associations are asking for uh, a, a, a delay or a pushback in terms of when they have to adopt some of the regulations. So there is that impact. Um, the other challenge is that there has been quite an, uh, an increase in the consumption patterns. Uh, we were starting to see some early insights uh, where we see a lot more uh, food packaging and delivery and then in, in the protective equipment. And all of this is also adding to the numbers of uh, single use plastics and uh, with people uh, probably eating in and, and you know, doing more takeout and, and those kind of uh, services being uh, being sought after, then there has, there has been quite an increase in, in the consumption of these materials uh, yeah. and, and really no solution because waste picking and waste collection has also been uh, 
brought down to its very, very basic uh, form. And so it's all just being collected on mass in many of these yeah. countries. Yeah. So, so Sarah, do you have any final thoughts on, on the uh, ripple effect of COVID across uh, the movement of uh, waste, including single use plastic waste? I think I think it's a very temporary measure, I, and I think there's you know there's constantly something that challenges the waste management sector and the you know the circular economy sector, and this is just another one of those challenges. And you know I mean I think one of the participants said you know the European Commission has been very strong on the fact that they are not accepting any delays in terms of the implementation of the single use plastic directive because it's not warranted. And you are seeing you know producers and manufacturers will push back as far as they can on any piece of legislation and use any opportunity to do that so I think I think we'll get you know the countries have to stay strong um, and uh, and this will you know this will just be another um, hurdle that we all need to overcome but ultimately I think the momentum is there I mean I, you know I, I think over the last three or four years you know I've, I've been in the US for like four and a half years it's a very different place now even here where well, you know before it took ten years for California to get a plastic bag ban, now actively a lot of states are talking about EPR. Very, um, and, and producers are talking about EPR. And I think we're in a very different position than we were a very few years ago. So I think the momentum's there, and this is just another obstacle that we will overcome and move forward. Great, great. Well, if it happens in the U.S., then it can happen anywhere, right? As we know. So uh, great, great. <laughs> yes. Yes. So, 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 Swetha, can I pass it back to you? I think uh, we've we've exhausted our hour, and I and, and I'll say this: uh, the questions have come in fast and furious, and so I think you know perhaps we can undertake to uh, after the session to see if we can respond to more uh, more of them in a more concrete way. But uh, we certainly appreciate all the the input, the chats, and the the questions that have come in. So, um, thanks to everyone who's. Uh, uh, viewed this session today, and and if you haven't got your the answer to your question, I think we will certainly prepare to work on it. Yes, thank you, Jonathan. Thanks a lot, and uh, as thank you to uh, both Jonathan as well as all the panelists for taking your time off for this particular webinar, and for all the attendees, please write to us at connect at wastewise.be. We know there's quite a few questions that our panelists have not been able to answer. We will make sure that we connect you to them or we will get the responses from them and pass it on. And uh, any studies that were mentioned, we'll ensure that when the uh, video goes up on our website, we will put it up out there. We'll have the links over there for you. So please write to us at connect at wastewise.be. And just a reminder to everyone attending that we have another panel day after tomorrow on Friday, which is gonna be on circular economy mentoring. So please sign up for it. It's already listed on our website. So. Thanks everyone again and uh, have a good day or good evening. Bye bye. Thanks, Shweta. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.